Okay, good morning, everyone. The uh, committee will come to order. Without objection, all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record subject to the length limitation in the rules. Let me, uh, first of all, welcome our witnesses. Uh, this morning, we will take a look back at the wars that ravaged the Balkans two decades ago and shine a light on how the victims in Kosovo are still seeking justice so many years down the road. In this committee, I find it often helpful to look back and consider what was happening on the global stage at different times in history, and there was a lot going on 20 years ago. In 1999, as we geared up for the new millennium, the euro was established. Three former Soviet bloc countries Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic became NATO allies. Boris Yeltsin resigned as president of Russia, turning over the reins of power to Vladimir Putin. And there was perhaps no more precarious situation than in the Balkans. The Bosnia War had recently ended, and the Dayton Agreement, concluded only a few months earlier, was only then entering its earliest implementation phase. But in Kosovo, things were much, much worse. After 10 years of crackdowns, human rights, violations of human rights, and severe ethnic discrimination, Slobodan Milosevic, the butcher of the Balkans, began a campaign to forcibly expel the ethnic Albanian population of Kosovo. In doing so, he displaced nearly 1 million people to countries around Kosovo, killed more than 11,000 ethnic Albanians, and initiated a policy leading to the rape of thousands of Kosovo women. Some 2,000 ethnic Serbs also lost their lives in the war. <clears throat> I'd like to specifically call attention to a 2017 report from the Belgrade-based Humanitarian Law Center, HLC, <clears throat> titled, The Cover-Up of Evidence of Crimes During the War in Kosovo, The Concealment of Bodies Operation, now, according to HLC, this is what it said. Since 2001, mass graves <clears throat> containing the bodies of 941 Kosovo Albanians, mainly civilians, killed outside combat situations in Kosovo during 1999, have been found on four locations in Serbia. The bodies found in mass graves belong not only to males, but also to females, and children as well. The cause of their deaths in most cases was a gunshot wound, mainly to the head, suggesting that the victims did not die in combat, but as a result of execution-style killings. The decision to conceal evidence of crimes committed was planned as early as March 1999 at the highest level of the government. No one has ever been held accountable before courts in Serbia for the large-scale operation of concealment of bodies of Kosovo Albanian victims in mass graves. I want to repeat that because it's really shocking. To this day, no one, 20 years, no one has ever been held accountable before courts in Ser Serbia for the large-scale operation of concealment of bodies of Kosovo Albanian victims in mass graves. I also want to highlight the work of Human Rights Watch in calling attention to the victims of Belgrade's policy a forcible rape of up to 20,000 Kosovo women. 20,000. In their report, Kosovo, Rape as a Weapon of Ethnic Cleansing, the Human Rights Watch laid out the case starkly. The research found that rape and other forms of sexual violence were used in Kosovo in 1999 as weapons of war and instruments of systematic ethnic cleansing. Rapes were not rare and isolated acts committed by individual Serbian or Yugoslav forces, but rather were used deliberately as an instrument to terrorize the civilian population, extort money from their families, and push people to flee their homes. Rape furthered the goal of forcing ethnic Albanians from Kosovo. But to this day, 20 years later, there has been little to no justice for the victims. Those who lost loved ones or who were sexually assaulted themselves have been offered virtually no avenues 
to confront the perpetrators. Yes, the U.S. mission in Kosovo examined the crimes, but they did nothing to secure justice for the victims. ULEX considered several cases, but the effort was largely fruitless, leading to only a small number of convictions. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTI, indicated Milosevic, who later died in prison, but it has not, they indicted Milosevic, who later died in prison, but it has not achieved much else for the other Kosovars who suffered from his army's war crimes. And regardless of the fact that the vast majority of war crimes during the Kosovo War were committed by forces under Belgrade's command, the same number of Kosovar Albanians were indicted by the ICTI as Serbs, seven from each country. No one thinks people who committed war crimes should get away with their actions, but nothing underscores the unbalanced international justice arriving from the Kosovo War more than this false equivalency. The United States and our European allies could have pressed for justice for the victims of Milosevic's brutality, but for the most part, we failed to take any substantive action. Even worse, in my opinion, the United States forced Kosovo to create a so-called special court to address allegations of violations by members of the Kosovo Liberation Army, the KLA. So let's see what this means. The special court addressed allegations of violations by the Albanian minority, by members of the Kosovo Liberation Army, but did not do anything for the Serbs, to the Serbs, who committed such heinous acts of violence. Very, very unbalanced. No one is saying the KLA was somehow perfect and didn't commit bad acts of its own. But let's be crystally clear, the vast majority of crimes, vast majority, war crimes and crimes against humanity were committed by the Yugoslav and Serbian security forces. That's a fact. There is no other way to look at what happened. No matter, said the United States and the EU, Kosovo needs a special court, and we proceeded to force it, force it upon them. Regrettably, I went along with this so the pressure could come off Pristina and the country could return to normal. All the while, did the State Department come down nearly as hard on Serbia, which committed the overwhelming bulk of the war crimes? Did we and our European allies demand that in exchange for progress in EU ascension, Belgrade must address post-conflict justice? No, we didn't. We dumped it all on Kosovo. Hence, Kosovo has a special court to investigate itself. Shameful and wrong, in my opinion. But my friends, there may be a silver lining. The law creating the specialist chambers allows the prosecutor to indict anyone who committed war crimes in Kosovo during the war. But to this day, it seems the court is only pursuing Albanians. I'd suggest that anyone involved with this court pay attention right now. This committee will be monitoring the court closely to see that it addresses the perpetrators of all crimes which can be prosecuted under its jurisdiction, not only ethnic Albanians. In the bigger picture, I think the justice for the victims of the Kosovo War will never be achieved if we and by we, I mean our State Department and the European Union, continue to sweep the whole thing under the rug. That's why this hearing is so important. It's critical that we hear firsthand from those who were brutalized at the hands of Belgrade in 1998 and 1999, and from those who are pressing for justice. We have an outstanding panel of witnesses this morning. I look forward to introducing them and hearing their testimony. But first, I'll yield to our ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas, for any opening remarks he might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we start uh, this morning's hearing, I want to address the developing situation in Venezuela. Uh, the chairman and I both got a briefing from Ambassador Bolton. <clears throat> I think things are moving very rapidly, um, hopefully in the right direction. Uh, I continue to stand with the Venezuelan people and interim president Juan Guaido and urge Maduro to step down to allow peaceful transition in Venezuela and refrain from violence against his own people. The Venezuelan people need the support of the international community now 
more than ever, and I hope my colleagues here from both sides of the aisle can stand together in support of this cause for freedom and democracy. Now to the subject of this hearing. The war in Kosovo was a terrifying conflict that brought tremendous suffering to the Balkans. Over the course of a year and a half, ethnic tensions and violence forced families from their homes, took the lives of innocent civilians, and left an untold number of people scarred for life. Many of us remember the gruesome images shown across our TV screens or printed in the newspapers. Refugees were crammed into trains and sent off to camps. A spokesman for the United Nations Refugee Agency at the time said he was reminded of the darkest days at the end of World War II, with refugees streaming in all directions. We learned of horrifying war crimes that included torture, rape, and a program of ethnic cleansing carried out by Serbian forces. And by the end, over 13,000 people were dead or missing, and over 1.2 million people had been displaced. It was a full-blown humanitarian crisis. This would be the last major conflict of the 20th century on a continent that is no stranger to war. And while an operation carried out by NATO helped bring the hostilities to a close in June of 1999, the war never actually ended for many of its victims. The horrors have stayed with the people who were forced to endure them. Some survivors have yet to experience justice for the crimes that were committed against them. Although we have pledged to never forget what happened in Kosovo 20 years ago, there are people who feel as if they've already been forgotten. Too many war criminals and perpetrators have yet to be punished for their evil actions. And while this is a sad reality, we can still take action and do something about this. This hearing will allow us to discuss what happened and review ways to seek the justice that needs to be served. This morning, we'll hear directly from our witnesses who can share their stories about what happened to them and their family members. Their truths must continue to be told. And I want to personally thank each of the witnesses here today. And all of us commend you for your strength, your courage, your commitments to peace. Of note, I want to also welcome Ms. Goodman from my home state of Texas. I'm hopeful that your testimonies will shed light on these atrocities that were committed and inspire others who have yet to share their stories. I'd like to finally thank Chairman Engel for holding this important hearing. And I urge my colleagues to find ways in which we can work together to find the justice that has so far eluded the victims of this conflict. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. McCall, for your uh, statement, and, uh, and, and thank you for your uh, involvement. Uh, so let me uh, first uh, introduce uh, the witnesses. I'm pleased to again welcome these distinguished witnesses to the Foreign Affairs Committee. First of all, we're honored by the presence of the former president of Kosovo, Adefete Yayaga. President Yayaga has played a critical role in raising the statue, stature of the victims of Belgrade's policy of forcible rape of Kosovo's women. Her work has helped raise awareness of how victims of wartime rape for too long sat in shame and silence. She helped to destigmatize de the wounds so that people could discuss their pain and be compensated. Among those who will share with us her tragedy today is Vasvi Jurokratz Nechi Goodman. Ms. Krasniki Goodman made history when she became one of the first victims of Belgrade's campaign of sexual assault to speak publicly about what happened to her. I am deeply thankful for her courage and willingness to describe her regrettably unsuccessful attempts to seek justice for the crimes she endured. A true retelling of the horrors of the Kosovo War would not be complete without Ilya Batici, the murder and mass burial of his three brothers, all American citizens, by the way, the burial and murder by Serbian security forces. That represents, in my opinion, one of the worst crimes of the conflicts. Mr. Batici, whom I know, thank you for sharing with the committee your family's experience. Finally, I'd like to welcome Paul Williams, a professor at the American University's Washington College of Law. My, my, uh, my daughter is a proud graduate of that school. 
Um, he has worked uh, with uh, issues affecting Kosovo for many years. Our witnesses today and so many others still seek justice, and I look forward to President Williams describing what has happened with legal efforts in the past and what avenues still remain available. I'll now recognize our witnesses for five minutes, each to summarize their testimony. We'll start with President Yayaga. If you push the microphone where it says talk. Yeah. Honorable Mr. And, Chairman. And move the microphone a little closer. We don't want to not hear your words. Are we okay now? Yeah, yes. No. Honorable Mr. Chairman of the Committee, Honorable Ranking Member, Honorable Members of the Foreign Affairs Committee, ladies and gentlemen. As I speak here today, I carry the burden of hundreds of thousands of lives that have been shattered by the war in Kosovo. They want their stories to be heard, and they demand justice for the crimes perpetrated against them. It is not a burden to take lightly. We would like to use this occasion to share their stories and seek support for our ongoing quest for justice. Around this time, 20 years ago, NATO intervened in Kosovo to stop the ethnic cleansing of the Albanian population perpetrated by the Milosevic regime. We are forever grateful to the United States for its leadership in ending the war and opening a new chapter for Kosovo. Since then, we have been going through the tremendous task of dealing with grief and trauma, rebuilding our homes, building democratic institutions, and seeking justice all at once. Our dignity and humanity were stripped away 20 years ago. The Albanians in Kosovo, as the democratic majority, were the target of some of the most grievous human rights violations. The Serbian police and military under the Milosevic control carried out widespread and systematic human rights abuses. Other ethnic minorities were caught up in between, and although not the target, suffered similar crimes. Through an ethnic cleansing campaign in less than two months, nearly one million Albanians were expelled from Kosovo. Inside Kosovo, in a crusade of killings, Serbian forces round up Albanian men and women of all ages in door-to-door -door operation to summarily execute them. They perpetrated indiscriminate violence, separating families. They destroyed the social fabric of our community. During the Kosovo War, there were more than 100 mass killings, 74 of which well recorded. Over 13,000 people were brutally murdered in the war, according to the Humanitarian Law Center, including 1,230 children under 18, <coughs> whose lives and dreams were instantly shattered, 80% of them Albanian. There are still over 1,600 missing. An estimated of number of 20,000 women were raped, according to the Center for Disease Control. Two-thirds of the homes and objects of historic value were burned to ashes. The devastation of war made a return to normalcy difficult. The war did not only influence inter-ethnic relations, it also broke communities. The use of rape as a tool of war was meant to make war everlasting. I have met hundreds of women survivors of sexual violence. Their painful experience is still vivid. They still suffer from physical injuries and severe PTSD. For many years, due to the stigma unjustly placed upon them, they were isolated, deprived of the life opportunities, unable to even provide for themselves and their families. <clears throat> As a result, the vast majority of them live in dire economic conditions and in need for, of support. Still, every single one of them told me that in order to move forward, they need recognition and justice more than anything else. While today, very few cases have been prosecuted for this crime, there has been no conviction, not a single one. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. the only way to help these women and men move past the horrors of the war is the justice. Kosovo has established a special court to ensure the mechanism of justice for any wrongdoing on our part. This has not been easy for us. 
It is beyond our comprehension that there have been more indictment issue for alleged crimes of Kosovo Liberation Army than for the crimes of the Serbian forces committed in Kosovo, which were part of our plan, of a plan, a blueprint <coughs> drafted, orchestrated, and executed by the Milosevic regime. The main perpetrators of the most horrific crimes are still moving freely in Serbia and elsewhere. Serbian authorities even deny that atrocities in Kosovo occurred and continue to use Kosovo as a propaganda for internal political gains. The shadow of the war still lingers over Kosovo. It is present in the vivid memories and severe trauma of the survivors. It is present in the agony, agony and desperation of the families of the missing people. It is present in the memory of the loved ones lost due to the power lost of the brutal regime. Mm -hmm. Having experienced the devastation of war, all we want is a future in peace. That is why we are committed to the dialogue with, to normalize relation with Serbia. We have already made all the uh, comprehensible compromises in order to reach peace with Serbia, from the Rambouillet Peace Agreement in 1999 to Atisari Plan in 2007. Kosovo has made painful compromises. However, under no circumstances will the people of Kosovo ever allow their hard fought for independence, sovereignty, or territorial integrity to be placed into question. Justice for the crimes committed during the Kosovo War is a long overdue, but it is not to be linked with a dialogue with Serbia. Justice is not a matter of the negotiation. It is a legitimate right of everyone hurt by the war. This matter is bigger than politics and all of us. Justice is a precondition for the long-lasting peace. We owe it to the loved ones whom we lost and the survivors still living with the open wounds. And above all, we owe it to our future generation for them not to go through what we did. That is why today I call upon the esteemed members of the United States Congress to take a stand for justice, to hold Serbia accountable for the crimes and ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. I thank you for the honor. Thank you, President Yoyaga. Dr. Williams. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall, and members of the committee. It is an honor to testify before you this morning. It is also a privilege and an honor to share this platform with the other individuals who will be testifying before the committee. It is clear from their written testimony that the Kosovo Albanian victims of the conflict in Kosovo suffer from an accountability gap. During the course of the Yugoslav Wars, armed forces associated with the Serbian regime carried out genocide, mass murder, torture, mass rape, mass deportation as a means to achieve Serbia's military and political objectives. This campaign of terror and destruction was designed and implemented at the highest levels of the Serbian regime. It required tens of thousands of individuals willing to perpetrate such crimes and it left hundreds of thousands of victims in its wake. Every victim of an atrocity is entitled to justice, and every perpetrator should be held accountable for their actions. It is equally important, however, not to embrace the mantra of all sides are responsible, which can create a false sense of moral equivalence among the parties. During the Kosovo conflict, the forces associated with the Serbian regime were responsible for the vast majority, upwards of 80% of the atrocities. They displaced nearly 1.4 million people, that's 90% of the Kosovo population, killed over 11,000 civilians, and raped over 20,000 women. Yet, the United Nations Yugoslavia Tribunal indicted an almost equal number of alleged Serbian regime perpetrators and alleged Kosovo Liberation Army perpetrators. None of the indictments of the alleged Serbian perpetrators included charges of rape 
or sexual violence as a standalone atrocity. In total, the UN Yugoslav Tribunal only convicted six Serbian regime perpetrators for the atrocities in the Kosovo conflict. The domestic hybrid mechanisms created by the UN mission in Kosovo and subsequently by the European Union rule of law mission disproportionately indicted Kosovo Albanians by a factor of 10 to one and only convicted four Serbian regime perpetrators. Again, with no charges of rape as a standalone atrocity crime. In 2015, the international community exerted substantial diplomatic pressure on the government of Kosovo to create the Kosovo Specialist Chambers and the Specialist Prosecutor's Office. The general diplomatic characterization of the court is that it is designed to solely prosecute ethnic Albanians who served in the Kosovo Liberation Army. If this characterization is correct, then the court essentially grants de facto amnesty to perpetrators who committed atrocities on behalf of the Serbian regime, and it closes off effective justice for hundreds of thousands of victims in Kosovo. No other international or hybrid criminal tribunal has been ethnically based or has denied justice to such a substantial number of victims. The accountability gap created by the actions of the international community and the United States derives from the 20 years old approach of the European Union to the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, accommodation and appeasement of the Serbian regime. This approach requires maintaining a perception of moral equivalence among all the parties to the conflict. However, false moral equivalence, the creation of ethnic-based courts, the denial of access to justice for victims, and the fostering of ethnic injustice undermines the legitimacy of accountability mechanisms and their ability to promote reconciliation, which is essential to create a durable peace. The myopic focus of the international sponsors of the specialist chambers is disappointing for two reasons. First, as detailed in my written statement, the statute adopted by the Parliament of Kosovo does not actually preclude the prosecution of all individuals responsible for crimes committed in Kosovo, and thus could serve as a vehicle for justice for every atrocity victim, regardless of ethnicity. Second, the statute provides for the state of the art of victim representation and witness protection, which are key to the successful prosecution of the conflict-related sexual violence. The court has the potential to be an ideal mechanism to bring justice for the 20,000 victims of rape in Kosovo. In conclusion, to accomplish the res restoration of the integrity of the specialist chamber, the United States should work with the government of Kosovo to affirm and if necessary, clarify that the mandate of the court covers all crimes committed in the territory of Kosovo and is not limited to prosecuting members of a specific ethnic group of alleged perpetrators. If necessary, the United States can work with Kosovo to amend the statute to make this mandate unambiguously clear. The United States should also work with the government of Kosovo to encourage the Specialist Prosecutor's Office, a part of the judicial system of Kosovo, to prioritize the investigation and prosecution of rape and other conflict-related sexual violence. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Mr. Petici. Chairman Engel, <coughs> ranking members of McLeod, members of the committee, thank you for hosting this important hearing and inviting me to testify. My name is Ilir Bitucci. Mr. Bitucci, could you just pull the microphone a little closer to you, to your sure. lips? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. My name is Ilir Bitucci. On behalf of my family and other victims of war crimes committed during the Kosovo War, I am here to offer you a, the word of simple message. Vic victims cannot be ignored. If you want lasting peace in Balkans, we cannot be ignored. If you care about justice, we cannot be ignored. And if all you want is simple the truth, we cannot be ignored. As I hope to make clear today, this history is still being written. This committee can help shape it, its course. I come from an Albanian, American Albanian immigrant family, New York. I grew up between United States and Kosovo with lots of siblings, including my brother Fatos, Uli, Agron, and Mehmet. 
We were close family. One for all, all for one. But six boys in New York, imagine the headaches we gave my mother. In the late 90s, we started hearing about the, uh, what was happening in Kosovo. We were devastated to see images of our friends, families being expelled from their homes and murdered in their villages. We worried over sick, thinking about my mother, sister, and my brother Fatos, who were in Kosovo at the time. Around this time, we got word from American Albanian community in New York that people were going to, over to fight against President Milosevic's barbaric campaign in ethnic cleansing. Uli Agron Mehmet went without hesitation. They weren't scared. The last thing, last thing I told them was, be safe, you know I expect you to come back. Towards the end of the war, my brothers decided to stay in Kosovo and help with the rebuilt efforts. One day, they agreed to go, to go in a humanitarian mission to help some Romans, neighbors, get to a safe zone. Eventually, Serbian police came in unmarked cars and in plain clothing and kidnapped my brothers. They took them to the other side of Serbia, to Petrovo Selo. Two years later, the, their bodies were found on top of a mass grave in Petrovo Selo, with their hands tied behind their backs and bullet holes through the back of their heads. My brothers were sent to these killing grounds because they were Albanians. They were murdered because they were Americans. This had devastated my family. For the past 20 years, my brother Fatos and I have been fighting for justice because the Serbian government won't. In 2015, then Prime Minister Aleksandr Vucic admitted as much. He looked my brother Fatos in the eye and said, in uncertain matter, in my mind, only two people are responsible for these murders. Then he named the names. This is not some unsolved mystery. It's a simple matter of will. Then as prime minister and now as a president, Alexander Vucic protects war criminals who murdered my brothers. President Vucic has no shame about this. He has threatened my family for our efforts for five years. Now, he has promised members of this committee and the United States pres Vice President that he would resolve this case. Earlier this year in Munich, President Vucic bragged to Serbian media that he told members of this committee that NATO officials should be extradited to Serbia, not the war criminals who murdered the American citizens. This is a systematic problem with Serbia. The government consistently protects war criminals, creating a political culture that intimidates witnesses and victims. Convicted war criminals are regularly given a hero's welcome when they exit the ICTU prison. Recently, President Vucic had an audience to call Slobodan Milosevic a great leader. Serbian war crimes institutes are failing in many ways. They, they issue very few indictments the few indictments they allow are low-level suspects and direct perpetrators. Superior officers are shielded from scrutiny. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the Humanitarian Law Center, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and others have each noted this deflect. Recently, Serbia did not have a leading war crime prosecutor for 18 months when Serbia Parliament finally elected one the candidate won based on the pledge of prioritizing cases of Serbian victims, not cases like ours. These are many other problems in, illustrated in back, lack of effort to will resolve war crimes. Mr. Chairman, this effort affects other issues that I know you, are, you care deeply about. There are still over... 1,300 missing persons for the, from, from the war, many of whom had not been found because the cover-up operations that co occurred at the end of the war, the main suspect in Batucci case, and principal responsibility over many of these covered operations. To date, Serbia has not prosecuted a single person for the cover-ups. The good news is that concrete things that the Congress, the European Union, Serbia, and even Kosovo can help these causes. First of all, I urge you 
to do the following. Pass the HCON resolution, 32 resolution regarding the case that was recently introduced by Republican Lee Zeldin, Chairman Engel, and Republican Grace Meng. When the Congress speaks, Serbia listens. Make sure that the European Union counterparts prioritize these issues as they Serbia currently in the midst of their EU accession process. To date, Serbia hasn't allowed Ser Serbia has been allowed to open relevant chapters just by making empty promises. This must stop. Considering legislation to give the president and my family more tools to pursue justice in this case, where Americans are killed abroad by foreign governments. Our advocate at the hum advocates at the pretrial Rights International have forwarded a legislative proposal to some of your offices regarding these issues. Would be happy to share with any other members of the committee. Second, I urge the European Union to do one simple thing. Start prioritizing, prioritizing accountability for war crimes during both Serbia accession process during the related dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade. There are a number of ways to do this. Mr. Chairman, I strongly support your call to not allow Serbia to enter the EU until it cleans up its act. Serbia should not be allowed to enter the EU until it proves that it can do and will complete prosecution mid and high-ranking war criminals and the responsible for the cover-up operation. Additional, the international community has taken creative approaches to work with the countries in the region that have similarly forced pro faced problems, such as locating, trial, locating trials outside the country borders. It is now time for the EU, United States, and the international partners to consider similar options for Serbia. Also, the EU should not shy away from difficulties between, but relate issues like justice sector cooperation between Serbia and Kosovo, both countries need to cooperate in all types of cross-border criminal investigations. The EU should make sure that they have agreement in place. To Serbian leaders, I urge you to change your course. There is no shame on facing one's past, only honor. Until Serbian politician leaders support their efforts to honestly confront Serbia's past, Serbia will never become a great nation that we all know and hope it can be. Finally, we are truly grateful for the many recognition that the Kosovo government has given to my family and other war crime, crime victims. But the Kosovo government can do more. It should make war crime justice in Serbia and regional cooperation in war crimes cases frontline issue in the dialogue with Serbia. As a sovereign nation, Kosovo also has the right to take real action in these cases. We urge you the international community to start prioritizing these issues. Thank you for your consideration, my testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Batici. Ms. Kresnici Goodman. P push the button and, and move the microphone closer to you. Yeah. Is this good? We'll see. Keep, Thank you. Keep talking. <laughs> Honorable Chairman Engel, Honorable Ranking Member. A little, little, little louder if you can just move it closer to you. Move the. Okay. Yeah, just okay. speak directly into it, and it'll pick. It'll pick up your, your voice. Honorable Chairman Engel, Honorable <clears throat> Ranking Member McCall, Honorable Member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all very much for giving me the honors of sharing my story with you. I hope it will shed some light on the depth of the issues that you are considering here today. On April 14, 1994, when I was only a 16-year-old child, a Serbian police officer burst into my family's home. He was looking for my father and my brothers, despite the fact that they were not there. I was with my mother, my aunt, and my two cousins. The police officer ordered us to show him our IDs. After taking a look at my ID, he kept it, and he said I had to, to go to the police station to give a statement about the men of our household. At this moment, my uncle walked over from his house and simply asked, why are you taking our girl? The police officer replied, 
don't anybody move or I'll shoot everybody. My mom told him to take her in my place. No, she's a child, replied the police officer. She will not be able to lie about word of mouth of her, fathers and, uh, of her father and brothers. The Serbian police officer then ripped me away from my mother's arms and took me to the Serbian village nearby. He walked me into an empty house just off of the main road. He threw me onto a sack of corn that was piled against the house. I started to yell and I screamed on top of my lungs. That's when he took me inside of his car and he started raping me. I remember everything. I was held at the gunpoint. He abused me and raped me repeatedly. I was shocked and exhausted. I lost consciousness. When I regained consciousness, I cried with no control, begging him to kill me. No, he said, I won't, because you will suffer more this way. He was right. I have suffered greatly since then. I remember he had a bandage on his left hand, and he was saying that Kosovo Liberation Army shot him, and he was taking revenge on me. Every time that I screamed, he threatened to take me to an area full of Serbian forces where more men would rape me. After he was done assaulting me, he went into the local store and left me alone in a car. I know the village was primarily Serbians, so I was terrified to make a move. Shortly after the policemen police men left, an older man came out of the same store and walked towards me. He forced me outside of the car and took me to unfinished house. I distinctly remember this man. He was an old man and he was crippled. There in that house, he raped me. A few hours later, I was taken back to my village and left on the street. I walked through the village cemetery, hoping that my life went in just right then and there because I don't want to go home to explain to anybody what had just happened to me. They told me not to tell anybody what had just happened. They said to tell them I was at the police station giving a statement about the whereabouts of my father and my brothers. Somehow I managed to make it to my uncle's house. I didn't have to explain to anything what happened to me. By judging on the conditions they saw me, they knew that no one takes a 16-year-old child to the police station for a testimony just to return her a few hours later with scratches, bruises, and torn up. The next day, I reported my case to the Kosovo Liberation Army. Later, I reported to the United Nations Mission in Kosovo. I also reported everything to the European Rule of Law Mission in Kosovo. The perpetrators of the risk crime, they were identified eventually. However, 20 years have passed, my torturers are not being held accountable for the crimes they, are, they have done, and they are still at large. There are 20,000 women and men who suffered crimes of war, sexual violence in Kosovo. All they want is justice. All I want is justice. Although today I live a happy life in Texas as a proud wife and as a proud mother of two daughters who were born in the United States, and thankfully they will never have to end and encounter the tragedies that I experienced. I will never have a peace with my past until justice is delivered. Thus today, I call on another representative of United States Congress to address the punitive war crimes and human rights abuse that was committed in Kosovo by taking immediate action to seek justice for all survivors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Granici Goodman, and uh, thanks to, to all our, our witnesses. Let me um, start with Ms. Krasnici Goodman. Um, this room got very quiet. When Thank you, first of all, for the courage of telling your story. It's not an easy thing to have lived through, obviously, and it's a very difficult thing to be able to go public and tell everybody. But it is so important if we are ever to get justice for what happened 
during the war in Kosovo, uh, people like you and others, Mr. Batici, uh, have to have the courage to speak. So I want to thank, uh, thank you personally. Got to know you a little bit last night uh, at dinner. Um, and I want to thank all of our witnesses. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, President Yayaga, I've worked with you so much uh, during these past several years. And thank you for your courage. Dr. Williams, you've always spoken the truth. And Mr. Batici, um, everyone in, in Kosovo uh, knows uh, the story of the Batici brothers. Everyone knows the story. And uh, we're not going to uh, forget ever about your brothers. We're not going to stop until we, we seek, uh, seek justice. Um, let me start with President Yayaga. Uh, thank you uh, for your service to your country and your efforts to raise awareness about the women who survived sexual violence during the Kosovo War. Um, it's very difficult even 20 years later to come to grips with what was done to these women and to, 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 to sadly say that we've had 20 years and we, we haven't done right by them. Um, could you please share with the committee the ongoing struggles of the victims of wartime rape with the committee and how can we insist your efforts to work with you in, in, in bringing people, people to justice? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, one more time for giving a chance uh, to us to be able to share with the United States lawmakers and to the uh, global audience how the justice has failed the victims of the war in uh, Kosovo and what are the steps necessary uh, to be taken in order to move uh, uh, forward. Um, we want to bring to the fore the issue of the justice for the war crimes and the crimes against humanity uh, committed by the Serbian regime, by the Milosevic regime, uh, by the military police and the, by the paramilitary uh, forces of uh, uh, Serbia. We want to bring the justice for so many of the innocent lost life. We want to bring the justice for so many of the survivors of the sexual violence. We want to bring the justice for so many of the missing uh, people. Our dignity, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, has been touched in our humanity, and we have been stripped off of that 20 years uh, ago. Many of the reports of the human rights and the verification uh, reports has shown, uh, and many of the testimony of the witnesses of these uh, uh, atrocities and the crimes committed against humanity in Kosovo shows that Kosovo Albanians, as the ethnic majority of uh, uh, Kosovo, uh, have been uh, violated and have they been a target of some of the most grievous uh, crimes and the violation of the human rights. Milosevic regime uh, wielded uh, the absolute control over the Serbian police, military, and paramilitary forces that they have been ordered to conduct this uh, series of the violation of the human rights. It was mentioned here that an estimated number of over one million people were made by force to leave their homes for the purpose of the ethnic cleansing. Only during the war time, it was also mentioned here, over 13,000 people have been killed and massacred. In between them, I want to repeat again, 1,230 of them children under the age of the 18, and an estimated number of 20,000 women and men are raped, where rape has been used as a tool of uh, uh, war. Only in a march of, between the March and April of 1999, about one million people were made by uh, forced to leave the country for the purpose of the ethnic cleansing. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, in the very beginning of uh, this hearing today, towards the direction of Albania, Macedonia, and Montenegro as a neighboring country, uh, for our people to search for the have, uh, for a safe haven. Uh, this were not only the country which has received the refugees from Kosovo, but we are forever grateful to many of the countries and the nations, starting from here, from the US, from the Germany, Austria, and many countries within the Europe as far as Israel, Australia, and New Zealand that has opened the doors to offer the safe uh, heaven for the, uh, for the uh, people which were facing uh, the tremendous uh, uh, crimes and 
and suffering uh, during the war time in uh, Kosovo. And here it was mentioned that the Western world did not experience that type of the ethnic cleansing since the Holocaust of the, uh, from the World War uh, II. And it is a true uh, uh, statement. And something that I really want uh, to stop here, because it was mentioned before I go to the survivors of the sexual violence, and I would like to use this opportunity to mention three uh, more cases in the round of uh, several other crimes and the massacres that have been recorded also by the Humanitarian Law Center in Kosovo, which is a long list of those that I want to mention uh, for the sake of the, this many lives that has been lost in Kosovo uh, by name, starting from the February 28th of 1998 to the, to the June 6th of 1999. And want to, I want to go by the every location of the crimes that have been committed here. It's Likoshan Municipality, Glogovs and Chires, Prekazi Poshtam, Ljubenic, Poklekiri, Rahovets, Stutica, Grajcev, Senik, Rezala, Dubovs, Obrije Eprem, Rajčak, Rugova, Neighborhood 2 and 3 of Skenderaj, Kotlina, Brestoc, Goden, Ternje, Bela Crka, Kruša Vogel, Kruša Made, City of Suhareka, City of Fuškosova, Celina, Padališta, Dužnje, Samadreja, Dardania neighborhood in the city of Peja, Mamusha, city of Jakova, Kruševs, Izbica, city of Podujeva, Samadreja, Beleg, Polac, Pastale, uh, Pastasela, Jovic, Ljubenic, city of Jakova, city of Fuškosova, city of Jakova, Nagavc, Marina, Kreljan. President, Reza President, yeah, yeah, okay, let me just, we'll, we will submit without objection, we will submit all these, all these names uh, so it will, it will be in the official record. Please. We'll, we'll submit that. I just want to very quickly say, say one thing and then I'll turn it over to Mr. McCall. Um, I have been to Kosovo many, many times. Um, and um, one of the most, I've been there with my friend Harry Baraktari and with, with others as well. And uh, um, I remember particularly in, in 1999, going to uh, a city called uh, Peja. Yeah. And um, every house, every Albanian in that city, which was an Albanian city, um, was forced out of their home. And as the people left their home, the Serbian forces torched each home, burned down each home, systematically, one by one by one, till thousands upon thousands of homes were all burned. and. Um, Someone presented me with, uh, with pictures of every home in pay of uh, burning or, or charred, and I, I kept that. I still have that uh, on my bureau, on my uh, dresser, in my bedroom, so that uh, every night it reminds me that there's still a lot of work to be done. The, the point that I want to, to make, and I guess it doesn't really require an answer, but anybody who commits horrendous crimes of war should be brought to justice. And we heard Ms. Krasnici Goodman uh, having the courage to say what you've said and thank you. And Mr. Petici, your family is, you know, I've been to uh, Kosovo where the monuments to your families, to your brothers, um, it's, it's a well-known, well-known name. The thing that, 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 that I, uh, annoys me the most is that whatever atrocities there were committed on either side, have to be brought to justice, but there were so many atrocities committed against ethnic Albanians. It's not even near equality, and yet when you look at what the international community has done, they've gone after Albanians much more than they've gone after Serbs, when there isn't even an equality there. It's, there were so many more atrocities committed against ethnic Albanians, and to sort of pretend that there's this moral equivalency is absolutely a disgrace, and as long as I have anything to do with it, we're going to, uh, to make that point and to continue to demand that people who did the terrible things to, to citizens that we heard from Ms. Krasnici, Goodman, uh, that these people are brought to justice. So I just want to say that. Mr. McCall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say thank you to Ms. Goodman <clears throat> for your uh, courage to come forward with that story. Um, I know it, um, as a former federal prosecutor dealing with victims, it's hard to relive that 
experience. And uh, Mr. Batiki, your brothers, um, um, it never quite leaves. And it's, um, it's, a, it's PTSD of the worst kind. Um, so again, I want to thank you for coming forward. What I'm kind of shocked by, Mr. Chairman, is, is the fact that we had over 13,000 people killed, 1.2 million people displaced. It's been 20 years. We have a UN, you know, UN administration mission, some sort of UN court involved, and only six people have been convicted. And I think, Mr. Or Dr. Williams, you said that rape is not even a, a standalone crime that can be prosecuted. So, um, again, I want to thank you for having this hearing. I just find that completely unacceptable. So perhaps, Madam President, Dr. Williams, can you tell us what has been going on over the last 20 years? Because those numbers just don't add up to me. I'll push the, uh, the button, yeah. the talk button. Yeah. Can I be here now? Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, we have about an estimated number of about 20,000 women and men that have been raped. Can you pull the, the microphone board. closer? I, 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 I don't about want anybody. About 20,000 women and men that have been raped during the wartime, where rape has been used as a tool of uh, work. Like in every other cases, like also in our case in Kosovo, there has been enormous stigma uh, surrounding the survivors of the sexual uh, violence. And uh, the reason why the rape has been used as a tool of war by the police, military, and the paramilitary forces was uh, to emasculate the men of Kosovo and to destroy the very fabric of our society. And their main intention was to have the war last much longer after it has officially ended. And they have achieved that because for 20 years after the end of the war, we still have this very living evidences and the proofs and the suffering among the survivors, each and every one of them, which are living with these atrocities and this what they have gone during uh, the war uh, time. In many of those cases, the perpetrators of this horrendous crime, they were telling even out loudly that we are going, even though that the victims and the survivors were begging them to kill them after they committed those acts. They said to them that, no, we are going to leave you alive so you can live with this stain forever and you can remember for what we have done this to you forever and for your entire uh, life. And every single survivors of sexual violence, no matter in which part of the country I have met, and I have met many of, uh, of them uh, throughout the country, hundreds of them, they seek only one thing. They seek for the justice. They seek uh, for the perpetrators, whoever done these uh, crimes, to be put forward uh, to the justice and to be facing with the justice for the crimes that have been unjustly uh, committed uh, uh, upon them. And fortunately, the issue of the survivors of the sexual violence, as you rightly said, Mr. Makalupa, is that uh, they have not been priority immediately after the end of the war, neither from the international mission neither from the provision, provisional institutions of Kosovo. Only the women activists were the open door to the survivors of the sexual uh, violence to offer starting from the psychological treatment and all the way down to the, uh, to the uh, uh, physical and towards the uh, medical treatment others. Only back in 2014, we as the country have started the institutional approach and care towards the survivors of the sexual violence. In that time, in my term as the president of the Republic of Kosovo. I established the National Council for the Survivors of Sexual Violence
Institutions, which open a totally new chapter for the survivors for re their integration, rehabilitation, resocialization, and the access to the justice. I, why I mentioned the access to the justice, which is very limited because so far we do not have even a single perpetrator that has been found guilty for and if I, and thank, you for, thank you for starting the National crimes. Council and for Survivors. And that's why we need, uh, uh, sir, there is a tremendous need uh, to establish the special uh, court in order to prosecute these cases of the war crimes and crimes against humanity and the crimes of the sexual violence used as a tool of war in Kosovo. I call upon this body, I call upon you as the United States Congress, as uh, the uh, body that has proven uh, so far and has lined up yourself in the right side of the history and that you have proven that 20 years ago uh, in the regard with the intervention in Kosovo of us to stop the war, to stop the genocide, and to stop the uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, to condition Serbia and to keep Serbia accountable for all of the crimes and atrocities that they did towards the innocent people of Kosovo. And it is really unjustly to see that the, uh, Serbia has a very open path towards Euro-Atlantic integration. And I want from this body to uh, analyze all of the possible uh, uh, circumstances to establish the type of the special court the way that we have established in Kosovo uh, for, for all of the crimes to be investigated uh, by this uh, body at the same time Serbia to be conditioned in their path towards your area towards the Euro-Atlantic integration. And, and I look forward to working with the chairman on the idea of the special court and Dr. Williams my time is limited but um, the United Nations I, has wholly failed. I mean it's it's I mean I was a federal prosecutor for many years this is this is incompetence. It's, it's inept. It's not working. So is a special court idea the, the answer? A special court with a clarified mandate is the answer. There were three reasons why the UN mission failed. The Yugoslavia tribunal was timid and tardy in its indictments. When it indicted Milosevic, it said to itself, we've indicted the most senior political leader tick the box on Kosovo. They indicted a handful of other small individuals. They then had a two-year trial, and he died during the trial, so justice wasn't achieved. The UN mission in Kosovo, the EU mission in Kosovo, simply weren't equipped, weren't interested, and didn't exercise the jurisdictional mandate that they possessed. And then the third reason, as I mentioned in my testimony, is this sense of moral equivalency. The European Union approach, which the United States falls into once in a while, is that, we need to integrate Serbia into Europe. If we say all sides are responsible, the Croats, the Bosnians, the Kosovars, the Serbs, it's easier to accommodate and appease the existing regime in Serbia. You saw this at Dayton, you saw this at Rangvile. And then you have the special court, which is the worst possible court one could imagine, which is a court specifically designed only to prosecute one ethnic group for one set of crimes. That's its public characterization. A close reading of the statute, and you know as a prosecutor, you look at the statute of the crimes, it can apply to all crimes, and crimes committed by all perpetrators and provide justice for all victims. But it's going to need direction. The important thing to remember is this court was created by the Parliament of Kosovo. The government of Kosovo possesses the authority to clarify, reframe, and if necessary, amend the statute to make it crystal clear that it's not just an ethnically based court. And I would encourage, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and let me just take a moment to thank you for your leadership on this issue for uh, a very long time. I'm aware of that. Uh, I did want you to continue on talking about the special court to try to understand exactly what you think would be uh, the best. And then I also wanted to hear um, in terms of our role, uh, the role of the United States, and whether or not you feel that uh, we've played a positive role in terms of bringing the perpetrators of war crimes to justice. And um, gentlemen, I'm sorry, I don't want to mispronounce your name. Uh, you described your brothers, and you said they were Americans, and I just it was wondering specifically what the U.S. did in uh, your situation. So I throw those questions out to the panel. The special tribunal 
has a unique founding. There was a report crafted by the Council of Europe, again, as part of this approach of moral equivalence. Um, it focused on its face exclusively against crimes committed by ethnic Albanians, but it did acknowledge that there were a number of crimes committed by a number of parties, and, and that's important. It wasn't the emphasis of the report, but it did acknowledge that um, a lot of what we've spoken about here today, about the preponderance of the crimes being committed by the Serbian regime. The statute has an odd jurisdictional mandate. The jurisdictional mandate is for crimes related to the report of the Council of Europe. Now, now no lawyer would write a statute that would lay out the jurisdiction and then reference it to, to a report by a, by a diplomat. But that's what you have. And then there was tremendous pressure put on the government of Kosovo to adopt this and then to physically move the court to the Netherlands. And that's where the opportunity comes mm -hmm. to turn this court around and make it successful. There are international judges, international prosecutors, and there's a list of defense attorneys that are both Albanian, Serbian, and international. The problem is, as lawyers, we sit and we look at the statute and we can say, yes, this can be used to bring about um, accountability for all perpetrators, for all victims, and provide justice for all witnesses. And in particular, and I emphasize this in my written statement, it has state-of-the-art witness protection, which makes it ideal for prosecuting crimes, uh, sexual-related crimes for conflict abuse, or conflict-related conflict sexual violence. But the diplomatic momentum is that it's a narrow ethnic-based court, and unless the U.S. government takes some action or works closely with the Kosovars to provide them the political cover to reframe... What do you see that action being? This action would be a um, statement by the Department of State um, explaining what the mandate actually covers. The U.S. government provides funding for this court because it's an international, internationalized hybrid tribunal to condition this funding on the proper interpretation of, of its mandate and to second necessary personnel and resources. And I'll, I'll end with 10 seconds of, when I was at the State Department in the early 90s, the Yugoslavia Tribunal was set up. The Americans moved money, they moved personnel, and the American government was heavily involved in crafting the, the Security Council resolution, the mandate, the statute of the Yugoslav Tribunal because America knew how important justice was going to be for durable peace, that has waned in these last few years and needs so, to be reinvigorated. Okay, and I know I'm just about out of time, but I would like for you to respond, and then I wanted to know if Madam President had a comment she wanted to make. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the Petrucci brothers were all American citizens when, uh, when they were in the 90s when the, the, the atrocity of the Serbs, Milosevic's regime was... Uh, putting on Albanian people in Kosovo. At the time, we had our parents there, my brother, younger brother, my sister, and my mother. And uh, we heard that the American Albanian community are gathering up together to go fight over with the support of the US government. And uh, they went and fought. They did what any soldier would do, protect one from other, other from the other. And uh, the, where the US government stands, the US, government's, uh, US government does do a lot. But the problem is Serbia. What was the response when they found your brother's bodies? What did the U.S. government do? They did everything. They, they started, uh, we started a prosecutor. After a couple of years, there was a prosecutor. The U.S. government, uh, Serbian government doesn't cooperate. You know, they, they, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Uh, they'll give you, you know, prom empty promises, which have been happening for the past 20 years. Okay. The president himself, he keeps the criminals close allies to himself. Okay. And then, Madam President, is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, I wouldn't have uh, more else to add than what uh, Dr. Williams has already explained as regard of the uh, structure of the uh, special court, uh, which uh, should uh, uh, only require some of the amendments in, of the current structure of the special court, which has been already established. And it was very well said here that uh, no court should be established only in certain ethnic uh, uh, bases in there. Uh, proofs and evidences are already uh, 
uh, there because they have been there for about 20 uh, years. And these are very well documented, uh, documented by many of the international human rights uh, uh, reports. And uh, that it only has the uh, political uh, backing or the political support starting from here, from this uh, body. It was very well uh, uh, described by uh, Dr. Uh, Williams starting uh, from your side towards the State Department and then back to the European uh, channels. Uh, and again, about the uh, necessary diplomatic uh, pressure uh, and the political pressure in the authorities of Serbia uh, to be able uh, to show the same readiness as they, we have shown in the case of uh, Kosovo in establishing this uh, certain crime. Because this is not only in the interest of uh, Kosovo, because this is also in the interest of the long-lasting peace in the entire region of the southeastern part of the Europe. We, it is not our intention to create a, a monster out of one nation of the uh, Serbia. Our intention is to have Serbia and the Serbian authorities to hold accountable and responsible everyone who has committed uh, these crimes towards the innocent people of Kosovo. Thank you. Thank you, President Yayaga. Before I call on Mr. Chabot, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, all the people who, are, who came from uh, all over the country, particularly from New York, to be here with us today to, uh, to, to witness what is happening. I'm very happy to see all of you. And uh, I want to single out uh, Councilman Mark Joni, who's here in the audience as well. Thank you very, very much. And of course, Harry Baraktari and all the people that, that I know so well. Uh, Mr. Chabot. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you very much for holding uh, this hearing. Um, I think this was very important for you to do so, and I know that you have personally been uh, very involved in this issue for many, many years, and I think members on both sides of the aisle respect uh, your dedication and your commitment to it. Um, I haven't been to the region or to Kosovo nearly as many times as you have, have been there, uh, learned a lot when I was, and uh, the, the coincidentally, the Dayton Accords uh, occurred just up the road from my district. I represent Cincinnati, Ohio. Dayton is just north of my district. Um, and I saw you nodding, Dr. Williams. I, my first question I wanted to ask you, um, the, uh, it, and the ranking member, Mr. McCall, I, you know, I got a sense from him, he, he's as outraged as a lot of us are about how the UN, the world has really uh, I, I think failed miserably in this. Uh, the Dayton Accords did get the war uh, more or less ended, uh, at, at least the, the, f the physical shooting and, and the bombings and that type of thing. But in, in uh, holding guilty parties accountable, it, it has just failed miserably. And, and hearing uh, especially the, the two witnesses that, that felt this with their families, it's just, it's horrific what you all had to go to and the courage of you coming here again today uh, puts all of us, I think on both sides, in awe that you're able to come before a committee like this and testify. So thank you for doing that. It's important that the world hear this. Um, so I, I guess, Dr. Williams, let me, let me just ask you this. Uh, as horrible as this has been, um, there, there are other atrocities and mass killings that, that have occurred. Uh, obviously, R Rwanda comes to mind. Um, uh, Cambodia, South Africa, uh, uh, as far as the reconciliation afterwards, is, is there anything that, that we can learn from how they handled some of these things that did or didn't happen here? Or uh, what, what can we learn? Because we need to learn as much as possible from this. Thank you. Um, by way of full disclosure, my Father's family is from Dayton, Ohio, oh. um, so it's uh, uh, we're kindred spirits there. The thing we can learn, there's two things we can learn about um, dealing with accountability and reconciliation. The first, it's it's important to understand the nature of the individuals that we've negotiated with to create the Dayton Accords, to create the Rambouillet Accords, and what sort of countermeasures must be subsequently employed. Three of the four signatories of the Dayton Accords. Krajnish, Milosevic, and Tujman were indictable or indicted for war crimes. Krajnish and Milosevic were indicted. Tujman died before mm -hmm. Carl, the prosecutor said she was about to indict him. 
The two chief negotiators for Serbia at the Ramulay Accords, Milutinovic and Shinovic, were also both indicted for crimes against humanity. So you have to bear in mind that while we negotiate, or the UN negotiates with these individuals to get to yes, to get a peace agreement, you're not going to find justice as part of the peace process, which is why you have these tribunals. And what we found in Sierra Leone, in the Ivory Coast, in Rwanda, in Cambodia, and in other places where there's tribunals, is you need a holistic approach. You need an accurate historical record, which the tribunals, but also truth commissions, non-amnesty-based truth commissions help to provide. You need victim catharsis. So in Rwanda, there was the genocide. The International Tribunal prosecuted uh, nearly 60 individuals. But then you had local prosecutions and you had gachacha courts at the community. And over 100,000 individuals have been processed through the system that Rwanda created. So the victims have their say. In a tribunal, it's the perpetrators who have their say. They're the ones on trial. Milosevic represented himself. But in truth commissions or localized mechanisms or in these hybrid type of tribunals that the specialist chambers could be, you have the opportunity for victims representation, victims counsel. And then you need more memorialization and you need recognition. And it must be a comprehensive package. You haven't had that in Kosovo. And that lesson hasn't been learned from all of these other tribunals that we've seen. So negotiate peace with whoever you have to, indict and hold accountable those responsible for atrocity crimes, and then expand that mechanism and develop other mechanisms for victim catharsis, historical record, and importantly, as Madam President had noted, to deny collective guilt. And I was very careful in my testimony to talk about Serbian regime perpetrators, because although it's tens of thousands, it's not millions, and it's not the entire Serbian population. And you need to identify and pull out those responsible so that there's a denial of collective guilt and you can have reconciliation and durable peace. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. If I could just thank the panel again for their tremendous uh, uh, testimony. Um, and, and hopefully we will, as a nation, along with the world, act upon this. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chabot. Ms. Spamberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much to the witnesses for being here. I especially want to thank you, Ms. Krasnichi Goodman, thank you for your testimony today. I, I appreciate you bringing a voice not just to your experience, but to the experiences of so many victims. And to Mr. Butici, I'm so sorry for the loss of your brothers, Uli Agron and Mehmet. Thank you for honoring them by being here today. Um, I'd like to continue the conversation a bit about the discussion related to the need for a special court. My area of interest is in, in recognizing that in 2014, Kosovo law was amended to recognize victims of conflict-related sexual violence as war victims, and this made them eligible for reparations. However, thus far, only 1,300 women have applied. I'm curious if you believe that were there to be a, a shift in the accountability process, the creation of this special court that you've talked about, Madam President, do you think that would change the pathway for uh, victims of sexual violence to come forward? And would that have an impact on this catharsis process that you, Dr. Goodman, have spoken about as well? Well, ma'am, absolutely it will uh, shift. Um, as I said in the very beginning, that uh, the issue of the survivors of the sexual violence has not been the priority, neither for international community immediately after the end of the war, neither for the professional institutions of Kosovo. They have been living in the uh, tremendous uh, uh, stigma from the society, and uh, actually it's not only happening with hap did not only happen with the survivors of sexual violence in Kosovo, but it happens in every uh, post-war and post-conflict societies. There is always a tendency of pointing the fingers towards the uh, survivors rather than pointing the fingers towards the uh, perpetrators. And it took for us uh, about 13 years after the end of the war uh, to be able to change the course and to be able uh, to step the, to pass the necessary step for the survivors of the sexual uh, violence to have 
have the institutional care, as you referred, and as I have already filed in my statement, that by the creation of uh, the National Council, which in a month after the work of the National Council, the legal status has been recognized towards all of the survivors of the sexual violence as the civilian victims of the war. The committee for the verification of the status of the civilian victims of the war has started its work in uh, February of 2018, and si till now we have uh, by about the uh, uh, about over 1,000 applicants. And definitely this has reflected indirectly and in, in each and every survivor that I talk to them personally, uh, before this process has started about four or five years ago, will you be, uh, uh, will you be able to step forward and look uh, and ask for your uh, justice? And actually they have been hesitating. Uh, but now has been created a totally different momentum that each and every one of them is willing to come forward. And as I said in a very first uh, statement, uh, they, no matter that what kind of the circumstances they live, no matter that they live in a very dear economical situation, uh, the only war that is being spelled out continuously by each and every survivor, and we have heard today also by uh, Vasfie, is that we want justice. We want the justice, and we want to see whoever has done this horrendous crime to be facing with, uh, uh, with the justice. And by putting uh, the focus on perpetrators, uh, we uh, also uh, have uh, uh, we have seen that the stigma around uh, the survivors has kind of like uh, shifted in another direction that uh, has been created a different momentum. And this is what is happening today is going to be another momentum for the survivors of the sexual violence, for the justice that they have been lacking for about 20 years. And not to forget that we already lost so many of them. Some of them has left us. They died due to the concept consequences of uh, what they have been going through. And so many times that I have been uh, arguing with many of the lawyers, with many of the prosecutors in the country, when it was a matter of the evidence, you don't need more than evidence than themselves, the survivors of the sexual violence. And most of those cases, they were not done or they were not conducted alone. They were conducted in the presence of the family. They were conducted in the presence of the entire village. They have been conducted in the presence of the in-laws and much wider group into that. So evidences are there. Everything is ready. What we need is the proper platform and mechanism, such as a special court, to be able to pre proceed and move forward to bring, for the first time after 20 years, the long-lasting peace in the hearts and minds and each and every survivor. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you so much for your advocacy on behalf of the people of Kosovo. And I'm out of time, Mr. Chair, so I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to call on Mr. Zeldin in a, in a, in a moment. Um, but I want to, uh, before I do that, I want to say to, um, to Mr. Batici, uh, I've had uh, President Vucic of uh, Serbia in my office twice right here in this building. And twice when I questioned him about your brothers, he promised me that he would, uh, would have a, a solution for me where, where people would, uh, uh, who committed this heinous crime would be brought to justice. And both times he showed that his word means absolutely nothing because there was no, never a follow-up. And even when I tried to follow up with him many, many months later, he gave me reassurances again. And of course, nothing. So it's, it's pretty clear that at the, the highest levels of the Serbian government are uh, not willing to do anything. And I just saw him again for a third time uh, in, in, in Germany uh, several, a couple of months ago and raised it with him again. And we got the same old, same old ridiculous uh, dodging. It's really just disgraceful. And I know that, that um, Congressman Zeldin is your representative. Um, uh, he and I wrote to Secretary Pompeo about your case and other post-conflict justice issues. and. Uh, uh, we're going to continue to uh, to be on uh, to be relentless when it comes to bringing back uh, truth and getting some justice for you and your family and your brothers, Mr. Zeldin. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And I can personally, personally attest from uh, being with uh, Chairman Engel in that meeting in Munich with President Vujic and uh, having many other conversations with uh, the chairman and his team uh, over the course of not just the last few months while he's been chair, but years. Uh, it's a very uh, personal and a, in a very positive way, uh, laser-like focus uh, on this issue. Uh, and I just want to I want to thank the the chairman and and his team for uh, making such a um, dedicated effort with a ton of follow through. It's one thing to, you have a meeting with a constituent or someone in our country, they share a personal story and you know, maybe you forget about it in the weeks or the months that, that follow, but uh, I think it's an important message and as I know that uh, President Vujic and his team pay attention to today's hearing, they're watching. Um, it's, it's an important message that they receive that on both sides of the aisle, this issue isn't going away. And if it's the 20th anniversary of what happened to the Batici brothers, and we're still here having this conversation, and they might have thought five or 10, 15 years ago, that fast forward to 2019, that we would just stop talking about it. If you look around this entire room, there's no seats. Uh, there, are, there are plenty more people who would be filling uh, these seats if we, if we had them, and that should also send a a powerful message to President Vujic and his team because they have goals for their country. And I believe and I agree with uh, what Mr. Bacici said that, um, and what Ms. Goodman said, that justice mu absolutely must be part of any of those talks for a future relationship. For a Serbian relationship with the United States, it requires justice for the victims. Uh, this is my third term serving in this committee, and I've heard a lot of uh, personal stories on different topics for different, in different nations around the world. Uh, I have to say that uh, nothing was uh, as emotional and, and gut-wrenching as listening to uh, your story, Ms. Goodman, and your strength to be able to be here and to share that story with Congress uh, and with the American people uh, is a testament to, to your strength of character, and uh, there's a lot of respect for you just to be here and be able to, to share uh, those reflections with us. And I think it really highlights for all of my colleagues uh, as they read through House Concurrent Resolution 32, as they talk to their teams about what that text means, what the, the message means, uh, that hopefully if, they're, if they weren't in this room to hear it, to replay uh, the witness testimony uh, from Mr. Batici and uh, Ms. Goodman, especially, and sign on. Uh, we need every member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee to sign on to House Concurrent Resolution 32. Uh, we need every member of Congress to be supportive of House Concurrent Resolution 32 and to send a powerful message beyond today uh, to President Vujic and his team that all of their goals for what they want with their neighbors, what they want uh, with a wider region, uh, with the United States. Uh, it all requires, and, and uh, well, at the demand and the assistance of the United States must include justice. In uh, December 2018, the Department of State uh, designated Goran Radosalijevic um, who, it was under Section 7031C due to his involvement in these war crimes. Uh, I am grateful that this designation was made by the State Department. Um, Gori's name has been uh, referenced in other meetings that have taken place with uh, colleagues, and he is known to be a suspect in the murder of the Batici brothers, and when Chairman Engel and I sat with uh, President Vujic in Munich. Uh, it was explained that there hasn't been enough evidence in order to bring a prosecution. But the family wants their day in court. Based off the evidence that exists, the United States feels comfortable to make this designation back in December of 2018. 
Uh, we have heard it acknowledged through people who have met with President Vucic in other settings, including Mr. Batici was in the room when he heard it out of President Vucic's mouth, uh, and others acknowledging that Gori is a suspect. So what does that mean? Whatever evidence you have now, 20 years later, it's time for a trial. It's time for a day in court. This issue is not going to go away. And for the sake of U.S.-Serbian relations and for Serbian relations with their counterparts uh, in their region, for everything that they seek, that justice is what this committee hopefully will continue to demand. And once again, uh, thank you to, uh, to Chairman Engel, uh, because I know that as President Vucic wa watches today, he knows that on both sides of the aisle that we won't let this issue go. And that is the key. Justice is the key, and that's what the United States must continue to demand, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Zeldin. Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question will be for Ms. Grisnigi uh, Goodman. Ms. Goodman, thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you for your courage and willingness to tell your story uh, to the committee. I know that it can't be easy, uh, but I'm sure what you're doing means a great deal for women, not only in Kosovo, but around the world especially the thousands who face sexual violence during war. And I want you to know that we're all here, uh, we all here deeply care uh, what you're saying and what happened to you and, and many others, and, and we want to do all we can uh, to help women in Kosovo to find justice. Um, with that being said, I have a special question for you and, and for Mr. Batiki. Do you feel that as United States citizens, our government has lived up to your expectations and how we should have sought justice for you at this moment in time. And what would you expect, if not that? Thank you. Uh, I've been a US citizen for uh, <clears throat> 13 years. When I was going through the trial uh, with my case, all the trials failed me. This, uh, basic court, appeals court, Supreme Court. P pull the microphone a little closer. I did not. Uh, the United States did not do nothing for me. No, they didn't. But uh, neither did my country, Kosovo. So they let me down. But I'm hoping maybe now it's something that we can start working on to seek justice. If it's not for my case, at least for the other 20,000 men and women, because we do need justice. Well, as my colleague on the other side of the aisle suggested, we will never forget what happened, and we will continue to look for justice uh, for you and others who have suffered these atrocities. And uh, Mr. Batiki, I would like to hear from you as well. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, <clears throat> yes, the U.S. could do more. They could put amount of pressure and take swift and precaution measures that uh, Serbia delivers justice to my brothers, not only to my brothers, but the rest of the victims of the uh, Kosovo-Albanian war, crimes committed. As you know, before I stated that uh, when Congress speaks, Serbia listens. The only way is political pressure under Serbia. That's the only way Serbia will cooperate, no other way. They'll promise you heaven, but they will not deliver. As you've heard the chairman angle, he was promised a few times, my family was promised, members of this committee was promised, nothing, nothing. He hold, instead of prosecuting the criminals, he holds them dearly to himself, uh, to his, close to his lobby. Practically, they were still in the government of Serbia. Criminals that committed, killed my brothers are still in, the, in power in Serbian government. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And I uh, see you visibly shaken in Ms. Goodman. Thank you for your courage to come and express so vividly what happened uh, to us, because this is the way we learn and how we can continue this fight until the end, until we can finally bring those to justice. Uh, my next question to you is, is, is to Ms. Goodman again. Uh, you brought your case to the UN MIK and the uh, EU LX where no action, no, nothing was, was founded and your case was taken up in the Kosovo court system uh, with two Serb policemen indicted and, and uh, ultimately the Supreme Court um, dismissed their case. Uh, do you have plans for further legal action against your perpetrators any other way that you thank you yes uh, we do have plans maybe to go through the chain of command that is that is my only option at this point but haven't you reached the the, the last place being the, the supreme court of the country or are you saying th international community 
uh, Supreme Court of my country, it's closed case. Now they're going to go through the chain of command. They're going to reopen my case and go through the chain of command. Thank you. Well, I'm very sorry. The international community has failed you, and we, the United States, will continue pushing this to the end, and we will not forget. Thank you. We and need, I yield back. We need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for convening this important hearing, and to our distinguished witnesses for bearing witness to a, an extremely ugly truth that still needs uh, to be rectified in terms of accountability. And I do want to thank um, you know, all of you, Dr. Williams, your testimony about the accountability gap. Um, you know, in, like, during the conflict, I remember traveling uh, to Stenkovich and met with hundreds of refugees who were the lucky ones who made their way over the border to relative safety, but obviously so many others never were able to make that trek uh, and suffered horribly under Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, and I think it's very timely, you know, 20 years later to be calling for all of the unmet needs when it comes to justice, which has not been served well. Uh, as you point out, uh, the number of sexual assaults uh, about 20,000 individuals were the victims of conflict-related sexual violence, uh, and that is almost a carbon copy of what happened in other parts uh, of that region, particularly in Bosnia. Um, I remember chairing a hearing uh, with Bianca Jagger, who had borne witness to exactly what was happening to Bosnian women, and the same happened to Croatian women, and still there has yet to be a full uh, prosecution of those who have committed these crimes. And I think the, uh, you know, this is a fresh reminder that we need to redouble our efforts. If you could speak to the evidence that was gathered by UNMEC, um, which obviously disappointed in the extreme, um, wh why were they so feckless in, in their work? Uh, and has, is that evidence still available? Um, I mean, one of the things we learned in Serbska as well, Republic of Serbska, was that one of the reasons why reconciliation could ha couldn't happen uh, is because people were living right next door to people who had committed atrocities, including in Srebrenica and elsewhere. So, you know, it's, it's the same thing, obviously, in Kosovo. Uh, so I wonder if you could speak to, to that evidence, whether or not it is still uh, usable. Uh, I remember when the original uh, court for Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, was constituted, uh, all of us were concerned, and I actually offered an amendment on it to ensure that we captured that information, because you can't do a prosecution effectively if you don't have actionable data and information. So if you could speak to that, whether or not that information still could be used, eyewitness accounts, for example. Uh, and again, I came a little late, so I don't want to be redundant on other questions, uh, but I will look at the record and, and go over your testimonies very carefully. But thank you so much, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. Mr. Williams. Thank you. Ms. Omar. I think uh, Mr. Williams wanted to, Professor Williams wanted to answer. Oh, I'm sorry. If there's time permitting, I'm Give happy to time. provide a Anytime. brief answer. I jumped the gun. Um, thank you, Congressman Smith. On paper, you would hear that the files gathered by UNMIC were transferred to EU Lex, and then those would be made available to the specialist chambers. But you can sort of imagine um, your crazy uncle's garage and a filing system. And that's, that's my fear, is that when these testimonies were taken, when the witness testimony was made available, the investigators for UNMIC EU Lex weren't trained, um, didn't prioritize conflict-related sexual violence. Uh, there's an incidence where NATO troops took over 50 testimonies and provided them to UNMIC, and UNMIC essentially said, well, what do you want us to do with these? And the NATO forces were saying, the victims are coming to us and telling us their stories. You need to get out there in the field and set up proper investigations. So I think what you would find is that there are plenty of leads and there are plenty of witnesses willing to tell their story and to identify the perpetrators. And that's what's unique about Kosovo, is the deep, deep commitment of the victims to seeing justice be done so that there can be reconciliation and they can live alongside their neighbors. It's going to need the resources that the specialist chambers has, and it's going to need the infrastructure that the specialist chambers has. And there's two things that are important about the specialist chambers. One is a comprehensive witness protection program, which again, when you're talking about conflict-related sexual violence, that's very important. And then secondly, they actually have a provision for victim's counsel. So when you go to the court, there's the judges, there's the prosecution, there's the defense, and the victims actually have the third podium so that they can be represented and they can bring the evidence 
They can ask questions, they can cross-examine, they can make submissions. So it provides that role of, of the victims to basically rebuild the integrity of what is a failed justice process. Again, you can only do that if you clarify, reframe, and possibly amend the statute of the specialist chambers. But that's the only way you're gonna get a durable peace in the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Omar. Th thank you. Um, I want to start by saying to uh, Ms. Krasniki Goodman how much I admire your courage for coming here today and sharing your story. We could all visibly see how shaken you are and how much you're still being traumatized by what happened to you 20 years ago. And to Madam President, um, so much of your testimony uh, deeply resonates with me. Like both of you, I'm a survivor of war. I particularly wanted to talk to you guys about the use of sexual violence and rape as a weapon of war, which you both, both spoke about in such clear and heartbreaking terms. As I'm sure you know, the UN recently um, put a resolution on the use of rape as a weapon of war was severely watered down at the insistence of the United States. This outraged me as it should outreach every American. In the first place, I want to assure you that the administration's position does not reflect that of the American people and does not reflect that of Congress, and it certainly does not reflect my position. As we continue to partner on justice mechanisms in Kosovo, you have allies in Congress on making such complete accountability. Uh, it's made not only for the survivors of war in, in Kosovo, but those around the world. And in this includes the complete range of necessary reparations, including access to sexual and reproductive health care for victims. Madam President, I'm hoping that you could tell us about your experience in leading the effort in Kosovo, what is necessary to fully address the victims of sexual violence in war, and how the United States can tangibly help address this. Madam Omar, thank you very much. And as I already mentioned also in my long statement filed for uh, your information, uh, that uh, we as a country, as the institution, uh, telling you the truth, we did not know how to handle with the issue of the survivors of the sexual violence for the continuous 13 years after the end of the war due to the stigma and due to the taboo topic that was existing among our society. Uh, but the turning point for the status of the survivor has been the 2014 with the National Council of the Survivors of the Sexual uh, violence, we started the process of the rehabilitation, reintegration, resocialization, and access on the uh, justice. Just one month after the work of the National uh, Council, uh, the law for the war values has been amended, which has recognized the status of the, uh, of the survivors of the sexual violence as the civilian victims uh, of the war, which automatically has guaranteed uh, and granted their rights for the life-term pension, which is directly linked with their further reintegration, rehabilitation uh, processes that has been put already within the system, leg legislative system of uh, uh, Kosovo. And uh, which uh, uh, it is, the budget has been also approved by the government of Kosovo last year, and we are in the process of the proceeding of the application through the verification committee approved by the government of uh, Kosovo, which is a very uh, slowly process going but we are very much satisfied because this will be another step forward on their continuous demand and the requirement for the access on the justice, which is also the precondition because with the application and the coming forward to speak about the atrocity that they have gone through, they will be able for the first time to share their stories, starting from the committee, uh, but also which will indirectly empower the survivors to come forward and to seek the 
uh, so much needed uh, justice that it, it has been lacking for the 20 years after the end of the war. Uh, Madam Oman, uh, we will never be able to offer these uh, uh, survivors with a full recognition, with a full reparation uh, or justice, or better telling you the truth, the, uh, that has been overdue for this past 20 years after the end uh, of the war. And if we do not act it now, which is the main reason why we are here today, to establish the necessary mechanism at types of the special court, which will be exclusively investigation, investigating the war crimes, crimes against humanities, and including the rape that has been used as a tool of war, we will, this will be forever a burden and burning in our conscience, and we should not allow this. It has been enough, enough happened for this past 20 years. Yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, presence and your testimony and the work that you're doing. It really speaks to the role women play in reconciliation and sort of helping communities rebuild as we are storytellers, we are the revivals of, of our communities. And, and to you and to everyone who had suffered the horrific war, uh, in, in Kosovo, my heart is with you. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Omar. Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. I appreciate y'all being here. I, I, get, I come from this a little different angle, I guess. Um, my father fought in the Second World War in the Pacific, and he, uh, he visited, went back to one of the islands that he was on the invasion on, but the other one he didn't. And as a child, I remember him telling me some of the horrific stories of things they found out that, that, in fact, I guess the Japanese were doing to the Koreans and these ladies that they had actually kidnapped. And um, it, uh, my father was invited back for the anniversary of that invasion, and he would not go. And looking back on that now, I think I understand why, because of some of the horrific things he saw that were done to those folks at the hands of the Japanese. But, um, and I, I, do I call you president? Is that correct? I, I'm going to I'm going to try your last name, uh, Yai Yega. Not close, close, close. I got it. All right. Well, thank you, ma'am. I'm from East Tennessee, and the chairman always thinks I'm from his hometown of New York, but I'm not by my accent. So, but I'm concerned about the um, Serbians. It says low political will, but that's politically correct. I just think it's gutless that they will um, to investigate these war crimes. And what more can we do as a country, and I can as a congressman from Tennessee, um, to do to put pressure on the Serbian government to bring some justice about? And, and, and the follow-up of that would be, um, uh, is there any hope that we could have some cooperation between the law enforcement and the judicial institutions in Kosovo and Serbia? And I'll just throw that out to the panel, and Madam President, if you want to take a shot at it, that'd be great. Mr. Burchard, thank you very much. And telling you the truth, that was the closest ever I had when pronouncing my surname. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned the word uh, low political will. Um, if I may say, there is no political will at all. So far, we haven't seen that to be uh, shown or to be expressed by none of the leadership of Kosovo. On top of that, they have been using Kosovo and the crimes of, uh, that they have did unjustly towards the innocent people of Kosovo for the political gains in, uh, in within uh, their own country. And they're getting very easily off with that. And the world, the rest of the democratic world, it is not recognizing that or it's allowing for Serbia to get off very easily with this matter. In purpose, I did mention that it is not our intention to create a monster out of our of, of one nation, like the, same, uh, the people of Serbia. People of Kosovo has no problem with the people of uh, uh, Serbia. What we want is from the Serbian people and from the Serbian leadership to take the responsibility and to take for accountability and to keep them 
them accountable for the crimes that they have done unjustly towards the innocent people of uh, Kosovo. It has been way too far, 20 years. We are speaking about 20 years uh, time. That you mentioned an issue of the cooperation of the law enforcement and others. From somebody that has a law enforcement background, uh, uh, myself, there is uh, no cooperation whatsoever when we speak about the war crime uh, cases. And do you want me to tell you that the Serbia is continuing with their ongoing fight to stop Kosovo's membership in all of the international and regional organization, including the Interpol and Europol? Just last year, Kosovo has been voted against the membership in the Interpol, which is one of the basic international institutions for the uh, cooperation on the matters of the rule of law. So while Kosovo has shown that readiness at all the time, we have been always facing with the denials from Serbia to have whatsoever cooperation. And the uh, cooperation in the uh, rule of law, we are not only speaking the, in the war crime cases, we are speaking also the day-to-day -day, uh, cases, which are a handicap for the Kosovo's progress because of the lack of the cooperation for Serbia, we have that level of the organized crime and the corruption taking place in the northern part of Kosovo, which the Serbia is keeping the hostage or is controlling controlling their parallel and illegal structures which are operating in the northern part of the country. I yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Burtett. Uh, Mr. Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and for your steadfast efforts uh, relative to the Balkans generally and Kosovo uh, particularly, uh, and to each of our witnesses and all of you that took the time to be here today. It makes a big impact on us. Uh, and I want to salute you, Ms. Goodman, and you, Mr. Batici. Uh, your stories uh, deeply affect me, and perhaps most importantly, inspire me. And they say that sunshine is the best disinfectant. And now that we've illuminated the truth, uh, I believe it's time to start paving the path to justice. Uh, and to that end, uh, the tools available to us are somewhat limited, uh, but foreign aid is surely one of them. Yet if we reduce foreign aid to Serbia, it likely pushes them uh, closer to the, the Russian sphere, yet the, maintaining the status quo does nothing to inspire uh, a change in attitude. Uh, so my question uh, begins with you, Dr. Williams. Uh, how do we address this conundrum? Uh, what levers do you think might be available to us to, uh, to affect or assert the pressure that is needed, uh, particularly as it relates to how we use our foreign aid? Thank you, Congressman Phillips. We have an amazing ally in the Balkans, the state of Kosovo, the country of Kosovo. And so oftentimes when we think about influencing a state's behavior, we'll think about what type of sanctions we might put on Serbia, what type of limit on aid, um, you know, what type of, of, of truth um, sunlight we can bring to bear. But I think it's also important to remember that we need to have Kosovo's back. They're trying to become a member of Interpol. They're trying to become a member of the United Nations. They're trying, you know, they adopted this specialist chambers with this distorted mandate. You know, they're, they're, they're contemplating reframing it and reshaping it. The United States needs to double down on its support for those things that the government of Kosovo, the country of Kosovo is doing to try to pave the path towards justice. So there, there are a number of mechanisms that, that, the, that the U.S. government has in its toolkit to, to pressure countries, but here you have a case where there's a country you can work very closely and very effectively with, and we have a long history and, quite frankly, a special relationship with the country of Kosovo. And that would be where I would encourage the U.S. government to put its energy to work to bring about a sense of justice for, for the victims and, and to put its resources um, in that direction. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, Madam President, if you, if you might opine on the, on the same question. Oh. Mr. Williams was very right that uh, you have no, United States actually has no stronger ally than Kosovo and the Albanian people, the entire region of the southeastern part of uh, uh, Europe. And the um, United States uh, can help the fact of truth and justice in your foreign policy with Serbia. And that has to be one of the priority requirements and has to be a part of the foreign policy of the United States towards the neighboring country, 
our neighboring country of uh, Serbia, and uh, use every mechanism possible uh, that the United States and uh, uh, this committee can do to make a pressure for the establishment of the special court or defining the new mandate and the mission of already existing special court to include also the crimes committed against Albanians. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, President. Uh, before I yield back my time, I, I just remind everybody that uh, we must be relentless, uh, uh, never a time to give up, and I think over time, uh, each, if each of us um, uh, with the same end game in mind uh, work together uh, in a bipartisan fashion on this side, and all of you collectively, uh, we will see the change that we, we desire. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Vargas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, I kind of knew you before I got here because of the family that lived with us. Um, we were very fortunate in that when we were seeing what was happening with the atrocities in Kosovo, my wife and I decided to adopt a family from Kosovo. And so we did. And so family lived with us for two years. Uh, Brahim, Sevdi, Leria, although she writes it Larij, we used to teach her that it was Larij, but it's Leria and Blarina. So they lived with us for two years. They were from a place called Podajevo. At least that's how I pronounce it. Um, not from Pristina, because so many people that I met later on were from Pristina. And so I heard of all the atrocities, all the terrible things, but I also heard of um, Mr. Engel because they, all the work that you did, and in particular, Bill Clinton. And uh, when I had a picture of Bill Clinton, they were very excited to see that. But I have to say, it's, it, they've, um, they live in San Diego now. They've, they're doing extremely well. Um, one of the daughters, uh, it, she's the, 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 brain, the, the, uh, uh, the person who runs the manager of a Wells Fargo branch. The other one's in college still. Uh, both uh, the, the husband and the wife are doing extremely well. And he's like my seventh brother. I have six brothers. He's like the seventh, and she's like the fourth sister that I have. They're wonderful, wonderful human beings and people, and we love them deeply. But the, the atrocities that they saw, thank God that they avoided many of them, although their, their, their life was very difficult. They went to Macedonia. From Macedonia, they were airlifted to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And from Fort, Nix, Dur, Fort Dix, New Jersey, they came to our house in San Diego. And again, they lived with us for almost two years. But I, um, I'm horrified that we haven't done more uh, on these war crimes. And one of the things that was interesting to me, I always used to ask Rahim, I said, how did you live before? Before, were you always fighting? He said, no, it was amazing. He said that, you know, neighbors that we knew were turning us in, saying that these are Muslims, these are, these are Kosovars, people that we'd known forever. They were our friends, how they turned against us. And some of the people that committed atrocities. And that we haven't been able to bring these people to justice is, is I, I think, a, a real travesty. So, Mr. Will Dr. Williams, I'd like to ask you, I mean, it, it, I thought that the, the tribunal was going to work better, frankly, and it hasn't. And why is that? I mean, it, we know that the, the, the crimes are there. I mean, I've been listening to all the testimony. Crimes are there. The victims are there. The evidence is there. Um, it seems like the will's not there. What, 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 what do we need to do, Dr. Williams? Because I, I think that we have to have a better resolution than we have today. Thank you, Congressman Vargas. The difficulty with the specialist chambers, the tribunal, is that, that it has a distorted origin. It came about because there was this misperception that there hadn't been justice for all. But as we've seen in, in the testimony, um, the Yugoslav tribunal and then the EU and the UN um, domestic tribunals hybrids bent over backwards to, to pursue moral equivalency, to create all sides as equal. And then somehow this court popped about to, to prosecute ethnic Albanians associated with the Kosovo Liberation Army. And there wasn't the thought or the need to perceive how it would become distorted as it was, was implemented. That said, it is an internationalized tribunal. It's a Kosovo tribunal, but it's a hybrid and it's based in The Hague. And you can read the statute to actually provide accountability for all of the perpetrators and justice for all of the victims, but there hasn't been the political will to do that. When you look at the public statements of the European officials or those that comment on the court, they still echo the perception 
that it's an ethnically based tribunal just focused on the Kosovo Albanians. It's legally incorrect, but as a lawyer, I can tell you that doesn't really matter. It's the right. public perception of the diplomats. And that's why you need a counter narrative. All perpetrators should be held accountable. All victims should have access to justice. And this tribunal, which is a state-of-the-art tribunal and has learned the lessons from a dozen other international hybrid tribunals, is the place to go. Well, I have to tell you, my time's almost up, but I have to tell you, I mean, there is no moral equivalency here. Most of the atrocities were committed by the Serbs against the Kosovars. I mean, that, that's reality. Um, and so many of the people who committed these horrible crimes you heard of have not been brought to justice. And I think we have to figure out a way to put more pressure on not only to have the back of our friends, but also those that, the, that committed these crimes. We need to apply more pressure to bring these people to justice. Yeah, Dr. President, yes. Uh, Mr. Vargas, if I may, uh, because uh, Dr. Williams has mentioned that there has not been a political will. It's true, it's never been a political will. And telling you the truth, there is never a political will from none of the parties would be the political will if there is not a sufficient pressure coming from the bodies which are required. And that is what we are requiring from you. The necessary pressure and the mechanisms to be used towards Serbia, mm -hmm. to call them accountable and to moving in that direction, to keep them, to build in this political will that they're supposed to have from the day one. Thank you, and I agree with you completely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. I want to just take a prerogative to, to, to you know, comment on, on something that, um, that Dr. Williams uh, had, had mentioned, um, and, and, and that is that um, you would think that 20 years later we would have been more uh, down the line. We would have accomplished more. We would have done more. Um, and, and President Yayaga said it as well. Um, it's really uh, disappointing that the, the will of uh, the political will of the rest of the world uh, hasn't really really been there. Um, it's just uh, it's just just un unbelievable. And you know, if you go to uh, Kosovo. Um, there is no more pro-American country than Kosovo. You get stopped in the street by strangers. They, they, they know we're Americans. They want to be part of us. They want us to be part of them. And um, I, I just think the, the people of Kosovo deserve so much uh, more. Uh, Mr. Sherman. Mr. Chairman, we've served on this committee together for 23 years. And during those 23 years, I have seen your dedication to the innocent victims in Kosovo. And I, I'm a, I, I've seen other members of Congress get involved in a particular issue or focus on a particular part of the world, but I've never seen any of our colleagues put their head and their heart into uh, a human rights issue as you have uh, for the people of Kosovo. I had the opportunity to visit the refugees 20 years ago, and it is appropriate to, to have this, this hearing now, not because something happened 20 years ago, but because of what is continuing to happen, and more importantly, not happen. I want to say a few words of praise for the United States. Um, as we've learned today, America can do more, should do more, must do more. But looking around the world, America is depicted as a nation that will always take a position against people or nations that are predominantly Muslim or of Muslim heritage. But in fact, no nation did more to protect the people of Kosovo, of all religions, a, a nation of uh, uh, predominantly uh, uh, Muslim heritage. No nation did more to protect uh, the Bosniaks and the people of Bosnia. And uh, chairing the Asia subcommittee, no nation is currently doing more uh, for the Rohingya and for the Uyghur. Now we need to do more, uh, but the world, especially the, the Muslim world or the countries that are predominantly of Muslim heritage, need to understand uh, America's role and that others uh, have not done as much 
And of course, we bombed uh, Serbia uh, twice, once for those to protect the people of Kosovo and once to protect the people of Bosnia. I'll ask uh, all the witnesses, but starting with Dr. Williams, what specific steps should the United States take uh, to help the, the country of Kosovo and particularly focus on how do we get Kosovo into Interpol? Uh, I, uh, that just makes us all less safe. If you're in favor of crime, then you want to keep countries out of Interpol. What argument is there to exclude them and what pressure can the United States put uh, on that one issue and, and other issues? Uh, and then we'll turn to uh, Madam President. Thank you, Congressman Sherman. The United States has tremendous leverage um, when addressing questions of the former Yugoslavia and in particular Kosovo. As you noted, um, the Americans through NATO led the humanitarian intervention to stop the violence and atrocities in Kosovo. It was the American airplanes which were doing the no-fly zone over Bosnia and engaged in the airstrikes to protect the people of Bosnia as well as the UN peacekeepers. Even 20 years later, the United States has tremendous moral authority when it comes to addressing issues in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. And it's appropriate for the United States to draw down on that moral authority when insisting that Kosovo become a member of, of Interpol um, when seeking to promote its membership in the United Nations. Kosovo is recognized by over 100 countries but isn't a member of the UN, and so this has some consequences for its ability. But are, are a, is there a particular strategy, Madam President, that we should use with regard to Interpol, the UN, or other international organizations? Um, Congressman Sherman, thank you very much. And, uh, <clears throat> First of all, I want to express our deepest thanks and gratitude on behalf of all people of Kosovo for the great support and the help that we have been getting from the uh, people of the United States of America and from the institutions of the uh, United States of America. We wouldn't be able to come this far the way we come if we did not have you alongside uh, uh, with us, and which we appreciate uh, that uh, uh, a lot. Uh, Kosovo, uh, all of the progress that we have done so far, we have done in the coordination and in the close co collaboration with all of our allies, uh, starting from the United States of uh, America. Not only Kosovo, but the entire region, uh, it is the investment uh, and the cooperation between uh, the countries and between the Western uh, countries. But somehow we are in the halfway that we need, if I may use the term, the final final push in order to be in the other half that we do not endanger any of the processes or any of the progress of sliding back that we have jointly invested so much in this past two or three uh, decades. You have referred to the composition of Kosovo. Actually, Kosovo is a very multi-ethnic and a multi-religious uh, community where all of the community groups uh, have been living uh, together for the past uh, several of the uh, decades. Tell you the truth, that has been one of the biggest strengths that we have been able always uh, to uh, build upon that, that none of that has been the reason why the war has started in uh, Kosovo, but the reason has been for the power struggle and for the egos of this, uh, for the certain political uh, gains which within the nine that turns their neighbors into the uh, uh, enemies in there. And so so Kosovo, in all of its initiatives, uh, no matter being member state of the regional uh, organization or the international organization, starting from the United uh, Nations, so far as Dr. Williams has mentioned, we have been recognized by over 110 countries around uh, the world. We are closely is, is cooperating. There any particular thing we could do yes, at Interpol we are to press them in the right direction? And there is a strategy in place uh, by the government of Kosovo, uh, which we 
we have shared with all of the authorities here and in, with other allies uh, what has to be uh, supported. Uh, but the priority thing is uh, to uh, kind of like make that necessary pressure to, from, towards Serbia, towards all of their supporters like Russia and China and other countries uh, to not use the veto against Kosovo in every single thing because they are not only harming Kosovo, but they are harming also other processes which are related to the safety and the security of our citizens mm -hmm. in the entire region of southeastern part of Europe. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Um, let me, um, uh, in, in conclusion, um, say that uh, this was a very uh, excellent hearing. I think that uh, a lot of uh, points were raised, and uh, I think the whole situation is, is there. It's going to obviously be broadcast all across the country on, uh, on C-SPAN. Um, and um, anything that we can continue to do to draw a light on the fact that this was 20 years ago, and uh, people have still not, not seen justice. I wanted to just add one thing, and that was um, not only uh, has uh, Serbia kept uh, Kosovo out of uh, Interpol, uh, but uh, also out of other uh, agencies as well. And it seems to me that if um, we are talking about ascension to the European Union by, by both uh, Kosovo and uh, Serbia, that it shows incredible, incredible m amount of bad faith on the Serbian part uh, for them to continue to, to block or attempt to block uh, Kosovo from becoming part of, uh, of these important organizations. It shows very bad faith, and I think we have to talk about that more and more. So let me conclude by saying this has been a very uh, important and enlightened hearing. I think that the issues uh, have, have all come out. I want to thank our, our panelists. All four of you are really excellent and really uh, brought home another aspect of, 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 of why it's so important for us to act now. And uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, I've gone around the world, but Americans will, will not be greeted better in any place in the world than in Kosovo. Um, uh, truly, the. The country has a uh, love affair with Americans, and uh, I've had a love affair with Kos Kosovo. So I want to thank all the people who made their way here from New York and other places. I want to thank our witnesses, President Yayaga, Dr. Williams, Mr. Petici, Ms. Krasnici Goodman. Um, thank you so much, and we will continue to seek justice uh, for all the people who deserve it. Thank you. The hearing's now closed.